Goa app Kaya. And uh, this is the third uh, in the series today. Um, and today's uh, webinar will be delivered by Dr. Chan Chandrajit Pajaj, who is the Director of Computational Visualization Center, Warden Institute for Computational Engineering and Science at University of Texas, Austin. And uh, today's talk will focus on learning an optimal subsampling policy for tensor sketches. And just to give uh, a brief introduction about Professor Bajaj, he earned uh, his PhD in computer science from Cornell. And um, uh, so his uh, research interests span the algorithmic and computational mathematics, underpinnings of image processing, geometric modeling, computer graphics, visualization, structural biology and bioinformatics. He's a, a very well-known uh, figure in these areas around the world. And uh, he's also an IEEE fellow. So um, we are very privileged to have you, Professor Bajaj, today. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, so uh, just to give a brief introduction about our chapter, um, we've been very active both um, at the regular section level as well as, the, as, as, well as at the global uh, level, uh, the Computer Society. So um, we've been recognized through some of these awards and uh, for all the participants, uh, we have the options to uh, be a member or a volunteer, collaborator or a speaker. So um, please with us, uh, our website and email and also on all the social media channels where I will go and I would be happy to pass on all the updates of the events that we conduct. So um, with this um, introduction, I would like to hand over the virtual stage to Professor Bajaj. And um, uh, just to inform you, uh, the Q&A session will be open once the talk is over. So we'll have a 10 minutes Q&A session at the end of. Uh, and, um, uh, and in the middle, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat window and we'll be able to take them up at the end. Thank you, and over to you, Professor Bajaj. So I should be able to share my screen or? Yeah, just uh, stop sharing. So here you go. I think uh, now you can start sharing your screen. Uh, let's see, how do I do that? Yeah, so at the bottom, yeah, at the bottom of the screen, you uh, will see share. Connect. To a video system? No, no, no. no uh, yeah, but that button is not lit up. Um, uh, Ramkrishna, can you make uh, Professor Bajaj presenter, please? Yeah. Also, I'm at the disadvantage. I just broke my glasses, so I'm. I see. Oh, sorry for that. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless. Uh, yeah. I just, guess. just, uh, just a minute. So. I, have, I have made a miss. Okay. Uh, so the share button is not open yet. So um, so I will show you Professor Bajaj. So open system preferences, maybe. So uh, um, so you you're seeing my screen, right? One second. Yeah, there is a button. I I have used WebEx before. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, sure. But it's um. Not lighting up. Maybe I had to. Have you um, joined from the web uh, web browser? Yeah, but uh, I think I know what way it was not doing it. But uh... because I think the web browser version of WebEx may not allow you to share your screen. Um, okay. Well, I just uh, did this. Okay. And. Hmm. Maybe I have to quit and come back or? Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, you may have to download the desktop version. No, Do you no, have there's a, okay, let me just go back uh, out and come back in. Okay. Yes, yes, please. Sure. No issues. So let's wait until Professor Bajar joins back. Um, just a uh, couple of seconds.
So Ramakrishna, you can start recording once uh, Professor Bajaj starts. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. I'll do that. I already started recording. Oh, I Hope see. Okay, then it's okay. Yeah, sure. then it's okay. Sure. I'm, I'm back and I can see the share button now. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. And I could just share my presentation. Okay. Sorry for the hiccup, but uh, no, you should let me see my screen now. Yeah. Yeah. We do. So, you know, uh, I had sent a talk title and abstract, uh, which is the topic I was prepared for, uh, I also have the talk on tensor sketches, but I thought this would be a more interesting and uh, one of the latest things I've done. And I think maybe you didn't get my second email where I gave you the talk title and abstract, uh, which was the questions. That oh, I was think was okay. Running stochastic decision making for protein folding problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you go back to the abstract that you perhaps circulated, uh, you will see that's the one that I will talk about today. Okay, sure. Um, and given the time, you just mentioned, you know, we may maybe need 10 minutes, so I will not go into as much depth. But I still feel I should give you a short introduction. Sure. To the problem and why stochastic processes and learning stochastic processes or dynamical systems um, uh, paves the way uh, for a lot of good, um, not only science, but mathematics, as well as uh, uh, research that will help us in other applications other than perhaps uh, putting forward. So this is joint work with two of my current students who are very bright. Conrad Lee is an undergraduate. Uh, he's just a junior, but he's won so many plaudits and uh, is a rising star. And Min Nguyen is a math PhD student of mine. And uh, he's going to, his research is uh, dealing with stochastic processes and learning optimal control. So uh, there are also, I'd like to get this out of the way. There are many others in my group uh, who help you know, preparing movies and videos, and I acknowledge them. And of course, I also acknowledge my senior collaborators over the years. And since this is a topic that I used to work a lot on uh, about 15 years ago, with the likes of people like Joachim Frank, who just won the Nobel Prize, and Art Olson and Terry Sosnowski of Salk, who started Europe's. And so you learn a lot from giants before you. This video that you're seeing is, of course, a computer animation of a phage. It's a virus. Is the video coming through okay? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yes. You can see how this computer generated model of this virus that infects bacteria to self replicate uh, or to replicate its parasitic uses all kinds of mechanisms to inject its genome into the virus. And uh, the takeaway is the fact that this is, of course, courtesy Michael Rossman, who used to be at Purdue, where I was before, and Tim Baker, who is another of my collaborators on neurology. So the point of that video, or the takeaway, is that most any system is dynamical, and especially even chemical forms, which don't have quote unquote life as we think of it, have a quote unquote life cycle of existence and replication. <clears throat> and these, you can see in this schematic how a virus has to be, you know, with the correct form so that it can fool the defenses of a, a cell that it makes its host. And the HIV virus, which we had looked at a lot on, uh, which has very strong similarities to the SARS-CoV virus, have similar 
mechanisms of entry and through a procedure of how it docks precisely and fools the receptors of the host cell to thinking it's actually something beneficial for the cell. It allows you to inject its payload. So this is much more sophisticated for human hosts than it is for bacteria. There in that video you saw, which is just a, a chemo mechanistic plunger system <laughs> to inject and burst the outer shell of the, but we are, you know, multicellular and this has to have precise target specific, you know, recognition of the precise host cell. And the HIV was virulent because it was attacking exactly our immune cells. And part of the SARS-CoV-2 family, which is similar, have envelopes and these proteins that uh, dock onto what are called AC2 receptors, uh, have that same evolutionary, you know, uh, mechanisms, um, which open and, you know, make uh, binding uh, with the appropriate receptors so that it can inject its payload and then use the ribosomes to multiply. Anyways, such complicated dynamical processes, you know, you're wanting to control, you're wanting to harness, you're wanting to subjugate, you want to stop their life cycle. Hence the topic of today's lecture. Can we control, and I believe we can, <laughs> um, control dynamical systems? And there's a lot of work done on controlling dynamical systems of all kind, but the molecular dynamical system is, is a little bit stranger, a little bit more complicated, a lot more higher dimensional, and hence requires all our ability so that we can not only you know, think about defining drugs, but um, navigating this wide state space or phase space in search for the ultimate way in which we can defeat the life cycle of virulent um, pathogens such as viruses. So the talk's going to be mathematical, but I thought I'd give you this and to see how biophysics and mathematical and computational biophysics has evolved in the last two decades. And, you know, it's not that you see far, if you stand on the shoulder of giants. The wonderful thing we have learned is that we have to learn how to clamber onto the shoulders of these giants so that we can see further. And there's a lot of work I'm going to go over very quickly, but as people have observed and validated, molecules show atomistic granularity. So each atom is there for a purpose. Nature abhors waste. But they take all of their atoms to form stable machines. And they have some definitive geometry. It's soft geometry, it's soft matter, but they have something in a certain shape uh, and form. Of course, their motion is random and diffusive. However, you know, molecules in a single side cell can reach each other every second. I mean, if it takes, if you're doing random walks and you're not going to make your objective, um, cell is like a busy factory producing proteins and peptides to replenish the things that are damaged. The hemoglobin keeps getting generated every so many hours, uh, and that's part of the life cycle. So the fact that even under this random diffusive motion, there's a dynamical process that is achieving its objectives is remarkable. Uh, and that's what people have been not only studying, but also finding ways to control. Inertia is negligible. So, uh, you know, it's basically the viscosity of the environment. So the environment is all pervasive. So you can't deal with molecules as if they were in vacuum. You have to deal with it. It's like teaching a swimmer to swim, but if it was, you know, heavy seas, then you have to teach him the right strokes to swim in the heavy seas because every action has 
the corresponding reaction from the environment. But most important is gravity is negligible and the interaction forces of neighboring molecules and ions dominate. So as was Mike Gilson, who did this, you know, a while ago, uh, when I was spending time in, in talking to Andy McCannon, and Mike Gilson was a student, he made this very nice video of, oops, of how molecules in their random motion find their targets. So we don't have to think of them as smooth motions, even though quite often we show them as smooth motions. So this idea of finding dynamical models of, you know, from observation, this data-driven approach has been age-old you know, since about the time when the first Nobel Prize was given to maybe John Kenrew for developing X-ray diffraction theory and, and finding the crystal structure of myoglobin. And then Max Perutz and others at, uh, in Cambridge. Um, biophysicists have been busy, computational biophysicists, in modeling these dynamical systems. Of course, our approach today is not going to be to take a fixed model, but learn Hamiltonians given by the data and how we can train them to be very specific. So, our goal here is not to build a single Hamiltonian that governs all the space-time behavior of this dynamical system, but customize it to exactly those ranges of actions. It's like having a suite of Hamiltonians that you can switch from, and those Hamiltonians are tuned by several epochs of training. So that's the ultimate we are gonna to get to. The other thing that is new is there have been two fields of endeavor in trying to harness such dynamical systems. It's to take existing models, and you see this first column is of models of the molecule. The second is the interaction of the molecule with the solvent. And you can't ignore either one because there are roughly about 50, 50, maybe 60, 40. <laughs> so uh, the fact that if you ignore any of them, the errors are so large that your predictions are as opposed to being just random predictions and you're not making anything, any inferences properly. So the world had started by trying to do optimization saying, can I solve these assembly problems, spontaneous assemblies of these viruses, or find drugs that would bind and annihilate a molecule? And, sorry, and it was in these two forms. You were either solving a giant optimization problem, but it's a very high dimensional optimization problem. And then people switched and said, no, let's do forward dynamics and then probably do inverse dynamics to understand. And both these realms have made a lot of progress. And in today's world, what we are trying to do is, can we solve optimization problems on the fly at every step of our decision making? So if you're doing a forward run of our dynamics, then at every step, I can use the power of a computer to do a complicated optimization and then choose the best path. But I can't be greedy in my optimization, so I'm gonna use stochastic optimization. But sometimes I have to explore alternatives because the molecules explore alternatives. And that is the reason why they have this Brownian you know, motion as well. I'm not saying that's what the reason is, but that's how the, they were created or they have evolved to become. But the problem that we'll tackle is an age old grand challenge problem. Can we predict how a protein folds? Can we predict the structure just given its amino acid sequence? And 
If nothing else as background, we can think of the protein as a chain, and this is a facile representation of a protein. It's just showing you the backbone, and there's lots of side chains hanging off of it, and I'll show you more about that. Uh, and what we're saying is, what is the final three-dimensional structure? What are all the folds? We can see little helices, you can see some strands, you can see some packing of strands in parallel, like a how you would fold your fold your bed sheets and yeah. You know. And so this ultra structure is what you want to decide carefully because they are pockets and tunnels that are created, which are where the binding sites of various uh, molecules exist, and those are conserved over time. The virus blocks the receptor by exposing its binding site, and it keeps it conserved. So, understanding this is not only in its static form, but also in its dynamical setting, is what one is going to use to speed up drug discovery. And uh, so, you can look at this. Red here is negative electrostatic potential. Blue is positive, and you can see that the binding is strong just because it cancels the potentials. So the attractor of this pulls this other one, and now this is a very strong binding. So these two molecules, the drug and the target, uh, lowered their energy, their free energy, and hence they are much more stable in there by combining. And that is the process that why molecules fold. They're always trying to lower their energy. So from the table I showed you before, there are many models of, of Hamiltonians that govern both the molecular mechanical and the interaction with the solvent. There's also a entropic term and the thermodynamic um, entropy. Uh, and all of this is relevant. Um, and of course, what one had done before was to harness it. You come up with fast algorithms to calculate them. So just to show you the, the effort that is required, oops, the number of atoms, I'm sorry, the number of atoms, uh, you know, and their distances between them are given by this Rij. And even if you had something like 10,000 atoms, in a protein, and you know that's a medium-sized protein set. Of course, you have smaller proteins, but regardless, even if you have a thousand atoms, you've got this calculation that has to be done for every term, which is n squared, and n squared is large, right? So it's ten to the six or ten to the eight, but it's large just because this has to be estimated at every time step. As soon as this configuration changes, just slightly, the force every atom feels changes. So it's a self-driven energy Hamiltonian that governs its, its folding, its changing form, and so on. And that's captured by considering the simple Newtonian, if you take the gradient of this energy Hamiltonian with respect to every position of every atom, that's the force every atom is feeling from its neighboring atoms. And it causes for this simple transport mechanism through an ion channel. You know how receptors like salts and sodium and potassium have to make their way inside and outside our cells. They're used for, and so is calcium. And they are channels because you can't ever have more than a certain quantity. And these channels are flexible and they are fluidic. And so even a single protein has a hierarchy of folds. And this hierarchy of folds uh, is what one is, trying to harness. This is giving you the state space. Every configuration is giving you a different energy. And configuration being dependent by every position of every atom. And uh, 
this hierarchy goes all the way down from the full structure right down to the atomistic detail. And again, here I'm just showing you what is called a facile representation of a stick model of a, what a molecule is. But at the end is every atom and every bond. There's something we call the backbone and something we call rotomer side chains. And these motions are a function of these degrees of freedom, which are all these internal coordinates, the, the phi, psi, and the rotomer angles. And one of our very famous scientists um, from Bangalore, Professor Ramachandran, whose daughter, by the way, is a colleague of mine at UT Austin in computer science, uh, you know, became famous for having studied these configuration spaces. They're called Ramachandran distributions. What are the free spaces which molecules take? And that has been, of course, used computationally. We use it still today. This high dimensionality of optimization spaces is, you know, really mind-boggling. But I thought I'd just throw this here: that even two rigid objects is six-dimensional, and then it just goes with respect to the flexibility of every bond and every. And we are trying to solve problems like: can I do side chain packing? And I'll show you a stochastic reinforcement learning method of doing it, and uh, some of the challenges. Also to predict molecular recognition. Furthermore, can I predict assembly? And can I predict viral assembly that takes on definitive shapes? And not only can I predict, or would like to predict, I would like to make it better. So I can build nano shells, I can build you know, synthetic proteins, which fold faster can be attracted to targets better so that you don't have to you take lessons from nature, but you can do it better. So the representations we use are positions of each of these atoms, their masses. The masses are contributing to their kinetic energy, even though they are you know, tiny, you know, 10 to the minus, uh, the, you know, what, 23 or something. <laughs> Again, I, um, you know, the band of all radii are small, but they are important. They are saying how close can two atoms get uh, without repelling each other because the electronic clouds will interfere. They have something called partial charges. There's also a density representation we take, and that is thinking of this as a volume occupancy and an interface we call the molecular surface. And this interface is mathematical. It's an artificial barrier between the dielectric inside the molecule and the dielectric outside. And it's used exactly in what's called the approximative Poisson-Boltzmann uh, calculation. So such binding interfaces are important and hence structure refinement is one of the biggest problems. Uh, and I'm just quickly going to show you the ways we used to do structure refinement earlier. And that is, you have to go back and not everything can be gleaned by imaging. And so missing fragments. So one of the first things one had to do was build a model of the receptor for HIV, which is called the N protein. And once you have that model, then you have a target that you can attack, and hence one try to defeat, build antiviral compounds. And that problem is now relevant for building antiviral compounds as well, besides the vaccine for, for COVID. Uh, but this refinement protocol is, you know, quite... Um, daunting just because the number of folds are so many. But what we want to do is, you know, control the molecule. So learn the Hamiltonian in specific instances and say, how do I control it? So to understand that, here's the first game that we can play. Saying, can I give you a molecule, which is shown in red, and I give you a target 
configuration the molecule should fit in. And can you fold this molecule so that it fits into this target? And I'm gonna treat this molecule as a dynamical system in its solvent. I'm not showing you the solvent, but that is. So the aim is to get as close to the target state as possible while using minimum possible control force. And this problem has been considered a lot and we looked at it a lot too, saying, you get protein structures from X-ray diffraction. You get density maps from cryo-electron microscopy. There are two different snapshots of the same object. And can you align them and match them, match and fit? If you do it rigidly, you will never get it correct because the protein in its, um, in its uh, crystallographic form is in a different conformation, maybe strain conformation when it forms a crystal than when it is in vivo in using cryo-EM, except the resolution of what you can obtain in from X-ray diffraction is down to the angstroms, while what you can get from cryo-electron microscopy is only about, nowadays, you know, it used to be a nanometer or, or more, but nowadays with computational techniques and better acquisition, you can bring it down to half a nanometer. And this has become so relevant now because, you know, the age of electronics has gone down to semiconductors. We are now to the molecular level. Feature widths are, are getting to become nanometers. So uh, what is the dynamical state of a molecule? We're going to represent it as, say, U, and it's part of a differential equation. It's a, you know, fully a partial differential equation because the configurations are in space, and of course, time is the, is the, um, the other dimension. So to guide the system to a given target state necessitates the use of what we'll be calling an agent to control the dynamic suitability. And the agent is gonna use a control force. So it's going to use derivatives of the velocity. And that's a key insight that, again, I did not come up with, but came up with von Triagen a long time ago. And I'll show you how we use it now. Because there's always challenges remaining and lots of other things that have to be done. So we call this first thing, the structure refinement game. And this structure refinement game is learning with reinforcement control, how I can take a molecule and control it to fit the target. And an episode of this game is, you know, what we call SRG, is to match and fold the molecular solvent as an agent. So the molecule is in its nativity because it's interaction with the solvent and the Hamiltonian that guides it. And the target is a map, which is given by, say, some cryo-electron microscopy calculation. The state of the agent is given by the configurational parameters of the molecule and the solvent. And this is important because the solvent is a lot more having a lot more state variables if you want to take a discrete representation for it. Actions of the agent correspond to controlling the system by a learned control, which is a bias to the Hamiltonian. And I'll tell you more about this in a second. And the reward in this reinforcement learning game is based on the correctness of the folded configuration of the agent, which matches and fits the density of the target. And in the shortest possible time, when we solve optimization problems, we want to solve it the best way and wins with the best energy scoring fold. So the winner of this tournament is the one who can achieve its target fastest and with the best energy. Best energy being the lowest free energy. Now, how to learn Hamiltonians and reduced Hamiltonians has been a topic that lots of people have done in machine learning as well. So building covariance operators or principal orthogonal decompositions, and of course, principal component analysis of dynamical trajectories is giving you a basis, which is a reduced basis, the Plasian eigenmaps, 
the Perón Frobenius operator and the Cookman operator. To explain how to do this in a reduced fashion will take another lecture or two. So I'll just put it to the fact that there's a lot of work here, including some of the things that we've done recently, but I'll fold it into what we've been doing. The, the main guts of our approach is something called an after critic model in learning. For those who are familiar with machine learning, this is essentially a, a way in which you can solve the following two problems. So suppose you know you have a boundary value problem. So you know what the initial is and what the target is, right? And I give you a reward at the end of the tournament. Say, if the process was deterministic, then, and I know what I, the reward I get, I can back propagate the reward into a value function. And that value function to, can tell you the value of every move you made to achieve a trajectory that meets the reward. That value function is modeled and its update is modeled by a critic. But this pointwise estimate is captured in what is called the Bellman equations. It's actually a discrete form of the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equations. Uh, Hamilton Bellman Jacobi equations. The, if I know what the value of my moves are, that is what an agent called or a network called a critic will learn. So the critic is like a coach which learns things. I know what the best moves are. And so I can give you a value for each action you take. And I can critique you saying, oh, that was not the best action you could take. So the critique receives the actor's best action and simultaneously learns a value function to provide the best value reward for transitioning from the current state and towards the targeted state. So it's always coaching you as to how you should be ideally moving. But the critic also has to learn. So initially, both the actor and critic networks are, you know, don't know the ultimate, the optimal. So both of them are learning to become better and better. And how does the agent learn? The agent receives some input of the current state and learns the best additive Hamiltonian, the best way to control so that it can move closer to its configuration of the target. So it's solving this optimization problem, saying, find the best action such that the, this cost based on the critics value and the value function is minimized subject to the dynamical equation. And this is just a linearized form of the dynamical equation. And this dynamical equation is governed by my control, which is UT, which is governed by an evaluation of my action, which is a derivative of the biased Hamiltonian, which I'll tell you more about in a second. So this mechanism is basically get a value for your moves and learn the best policy, the less trajectory to move as you go along. Now, how do you learn this? Oh, through many training runs. It's like, I want to reach down in a ski competition or I want to be in a climbing mountain climbing competition. I want to choose the best path so I can reach the peak the fastest, reach my target the fastest, which is the ideal trajectory, the optimal trajectory. Well, that optimal trajectory, the optimal policy, I will learn by trying many, many runs through it. So this is the deterministic way in some sense of doing this. So the critic has its own network. It builds its value update by solving another optimization problem. And these two networks train to get better and better. And this has shown some successes, but when we applied this to a molecular problem, we found that yes, after a lot of training of different ways of folding into the, into the system, the predictions were good, but they were not 
giving you good guarantees of optimality. So we said, okay, well, this problem is much harder just because it's a, it's a huge high dimensional Hamiltonian. And so this is not like taking a small ant like robot or balancing a pendulum on a car, which were the examples that people have used for active training. Our chains are much more complicated. And so, a, you know, apparently simpler problem is what we call the side chain packing problem. And the side chain packing problem is, can I, suppose I fix the backbone of a molecule. So these are some atoms I'm going to fix. And this is what is often called the, the amino acids backbone and the residues are what are distinguishing one amino acid from another are called the side chains. And I, I'm going to, you know, determine what is the orientations these side chains take such that they pack into the correct fold of minimum energy. So even if I had, you know, a chain and I had only two choices per residue, imagine this being a residue, then combinatorially this is an empty hard problem because in a chain of length n, which orientation should I pick will not allow me to choose whether this problem is, you know, which is the optimal packing because a decision I make here in positioning U might interfere with a decision here and a decision there. And this is why this is a decision making process. So even if I'm given a chain and I'm saying, tell me which orientation you have to make in a dynamical setting, I'm making decisions as to where should I place this person, where should I place this rotomer. And I have to solve this, of course, in a global optimization framework. But those decisions that I make for each one can leads to my trajectory, but that trajectory has to be, could only be suboptimal if I'm just randomly guessing. So this is how we formulate a stochastic reinforcement learning scenario. So we're going to predict the final folded structure from the primary structure and possibly a lot of training data from the PDB. Our state space is all the 3D coordinates of each of the atoms. This DI are the rotoma angles. These are the angles that are changing each residue, residue one, residue two. These are the backbone angles. So in a protein folding problem, all of these are variables. But in a, so the DI and the phi J, psi J, omega J are all unknown in a protein folding problem. But in the side chain packing problem, you're saying, suppose I fix this, then I just need you to determine the DI. And seemingly that would seem like a very simple reduction of the problem, but it's as complicated and as difficult. So instead of only finding the optimal X star, we wish to find the optimal trajectory from an initial configuration. So our casting of the problem is very similar to what others have thought about before, like Pontryagin, which is think of the packing problem as not finding an optimal estimate of the angles this will take but find the trajectory from an initial trajectory of x0. So find the entire path and use that path integral to go back and solve your problem. So let u be the velocity of x, where x and u are both stochastic processes. Then you wish to choose the optimal stochastic control, how to move so that the following cumulative reward is maximized. And this reward is given by an expectation of the entire value of rewards you pick up along the entire trajectory with a stopping time called capital T here. So what was Pontryagin and his students paper all about? They, they proved the following theorem. It's called the continuous time maximum principle. 
If x t u t is the optimal state control trajectory starting at x zero, then there exists a co-state trajectory lambda t, where lambda t is governed by the derivative, the spatial derivative of this, satisfying these equations. From these equations, you can derive the Hamilton, you know, Bellman, Jacobi equations, or the Bellman equations that people use in, in discrete reinforcement learning. So optimal control is minimizing the cost of your control. Reinforcement learning is maximizing the reward. There are two uh, dual problems. The fundamental difference is that you do this with respect to a deterministic Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian can also be perturbed with a disturbance called a Brownian motion process. So it becomes a stochastic Hamiltonian. And that is what we, what we did. We extended Pontryagin's maximum principle to the stochastic setting. So in the deterministic setting, this was, this, suppose you're given an optimal control problem of finding control U that minimizes some value function integral uh, subject to a differential equation. Then with the choice of this, let's call it cost function, cost to go function, which is related to the reward function, the optimal trajectory has this form. So the cumulative reward can be reduced to a pointwise estimate. And that was the nice idea of Pontryagin, uh, that your reward function can be estimated pointwise along the trajectory. So you can build a value function of your trajectory. So the critic can be trained. And if the critic is trained, then the agent, the actor will be also trained. I'll skip the proof. It's in the paper. A corresponding stochastic Pontryagin maximum principle is what is also in the proof of our paper. So suppose the stochastic control is to minimize this cost functional subject to this differential equation. But now with this all important sigma, which is like you know, a Wiener process or a Brownian motion process. So you're getting disturbance from the environment. And if the, deter if the sigma is also a function of you, the control, then this makes the process you know, not reversible in some sense. So, the cases where sigma is not a function of u are the easy cases, and that is the cases we first said we must try to, to work with. But anyway, the theorem that we prove, which is related to a nice formulation by Shige Peng, who was a student at Shanghai University uh, 20 years ago, uh, he showed that the, the principle uh, of Pontryagin for a stochastic differential equation, you can consider the following type of Hamiltonians, which is like an adjoint process. So you can think of taking the formal problem and looking at its adjoint, which is like the backward uh, propagation, and consider that to be a point process given by these two Ps and Ks. Again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you the highlight of of, of the of the main uh, uh, result. So by a, using this theorem, oh, I keep switching, uh, to the special case where sigma is u. So I'm saying, let's take the simplest case where sigma, there's no disturbance of Brownian motion. Of course, we do, this is only a corollary. We do take in, we have to take into account the Brownian motion. Um, and the G is just a linear G control. The Lagrangian reduces to a very special case. And again, another nice thing is that by considering the velocity and the derivative of the velocity, the acceleration, uh, we are doing a updated gradient method. One gets normally, you know, for free, a Nesterov accelerated gradient in my in our numerical solution. So with this formulation, if I took gamma t to be t cubed, then what we get is an accelerated gradient method in our 
in our final solution. So our solution is based on what's called the soft actor critic, uh, which has also been used in robotics. And the Hamiltonian, which becomes a soft Bellman residual based on the Pontryagin maximum principle, is all updated by a stochastic gradient method. And the policy parameters are also updated by a gradient update. This gradient updates are accelerated by Nesterov acceleration, just because we are working with velocities and accelerations. So the overall algorithm, which is a little busy here, but I'll just point you to the highlights. You have to initialize your networks. You have to observe the state. You have to select the actions stochastically. You have to update the velocities. So remember, look at this, this dj is the angle, but it's the derivative of that angle, which is the action. So you're controlling the trajectory. Here are some snapshots from one episode of dialanine folding. So, so far, you know, and at the bottom I've made some snapshots. And you can see that as this thing learns, it's minimizing its energy and it's also achieving a cumulative reward. But the change in the episodic energy is still quite, you know, what we call uh, fragmented. So as this learns to fold into the correct form and converges to the correct, it learns by itself or learns to the soft actor critic by learning the dynamics or the Langevin dynamics. So although the agent was able to achieve high cumulative, well, there's a high variance in the final energy. This is due to the Brownian motion term in the final optimal. And this is one of the challenges I want to talk about. So what are the challenges and ideas that one has? So similar to the soft actor critic, one wants to maximize the cumulative reward with an additional entropy regularization term. And this is based on conditional uh, entropy. So it's a, it's a mutual um, uh, entropy or a conditional entropy. Um, most other soft actor critic methods have been doing maximum entropy uh, regularizations. And as one can, you know, as one has demonstrated in this paper, uh, one has advantages, especially in very high dimensions. You don't want to be exploring too much, and but you do want some exploration. So this regularization is balancing exploiting and taking the best action in your from your current state, but not taking the greedy action, but also balancing it with exploration. So the Brownian term in equation can be adjusted to better balance exploration and exploitation. So how do we counter the Brownian oscillation with a fixed model. Well, what we want to do is make an adaptive Brownian process. So rather than take a constant, um, you know, um, parameter for the DWT, we are adjusting it as we go along, and not based on it's based on the state, but not based on the on the controlling uh, aspect of it. So. With that, I'll stop and take questions. I try to keep in time so that we would have time for discussions. And thank you for listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Vichar, uh, giving such a wonderful talk. I think uh, uh, the participants must have agreed with me. Uh, one of the problem most of the time we are facing, especially an optimization problem, uh, when you uh, when you uh, use this machine learning and other issues and other things. And especially uh, what uh, Professor Bajaj was talking about in uh, molecular mechanical, molecular systems, uh, you know, molecular dynamics, there are all, you know, something very tough uh, words to study on, maybe the research which you need to be carried on. So that's what we always, many times we are facing it. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bajaj. And I request if uh, participants, if anybody having any questions, you can post it in the chat box. I think uh, uh, he will answer your questions. Anybody? Having any questions, please? Anybody, please? They can speak up if they want. Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, if, if any participants wants to uh, raise a question, you can just uh, raise your hand. Maybe you can, uh, you can unmute yourself and you can speak also. Or you can put it in the chat box, please. Anybody? Any questions, please? Okay. You know, if there's any interest even later on in going in depth, or if you're interested in the papers, I uh, would be happy to send them to you. Um, most everything else is available on my website, um, except for the most recent ones. Uh, Professor, uh, there yeah. is one question for me. Uh, yeah. uh, any particular, any any particular interesting area where uh, you know, the particular area where I, we can uh, currently we can carry on uh, research work, uh, especially related to this. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are many, many. So, one of the nice things is you know the interplay of of statistics. Computer science and and uh, mathematics has been that if you're trying to control um, or trying to learn how to control any uh, dynamical process, then people are really at the infancy because uh, you know trying to learn a function is what deep learning allows you to do. And you're using optimization there with stochastic gradient descent. And of course, the big challenge there has been interpretability, but now I think most people are well informed as to what you're learning, whether you're learning a transformation, you're learning a probabilistic transformation, so you're learning something like the normalizing flow. And you can accelerate it using uh, various tricks, but the next frontier has been not only learning functions, but learning an entire, say, ODE, and then learning a PDE, right? So what you're learning is a differential equation, or you're learning a function, which is a solution given implicitly by a differential equation. But I'm saying the next step above that is saying, once I can learn, how do I control? How do I use it? How do I utilize it to make decisions? And that's where this area of reinforcement learning or, or optimal control comes into being. Saying, I'm learning this model, but then I'm going to use it to predict what the weather will be tomorrow <laughs> or, you know, uh, what decision should I make when I'm using autonomous vehicles? Uh, if a drone is flying and suddenly there's a storm, how should the drone react, right? Because I don't have indirect control. I mean, direct control of the drone anymore because it's already out. So trying to make decisions on the fly is also the same thing as, as um, in economics, we're doing it, we're doing it in our real lives. And we've learned to be very good, but with computers, we can learn to be even better because we have a power of supercomputers with us. <laughs> so we can solve optimization problems very quickly. And then that's why the best of computers can be the best of humans trained to play chess or go and so on. So we are just at the frontier. So the mathematical, statistical, computer science underpinnings, what data structures should be used so that we can do these things fast and update our, our you know, uh, dynamical functions uh, because the state is changing. I akin it to, um, I'll stop there, uh, but it's, you know, something of great interest of saying we should all get into this. <laughs> okay. I know, uh, I know. Very, very, very interesting uh, part. 
uh, uh, Vishwas, uh, can you share the final slide? Uh, do anybody, anybody having any questions? You can unmute yourself, you can, you can ask. Or you can share uh, your questions in the later part. Later also, the email address of our uh, today's speaker is already mentioned here. Okay. Okay. Anything else? So, uh, Professor Bajaj, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving such a wonderful talk today, the expert talk. And uh, on uh, behalf of uh, ITEM, the Computer Society, we'd like to honor with a beautiful tree, and uh, which we have, uh, uh, which have planted. We are going to plant uh, in your name uh, as a uh, as a part of our uh, social activity. On behalf of ITEM, the Computer Society, we're going to honor you. Oh, yeah. wonderful. So, you know, I love tigers. This is uh, yeah. the Pana tiger is uh, wonderful, wonderful. Two tigers, we have uh, special programs in the different uh, parts of country. This is one of the social activity which we are involving. Oh, wonderful. So, uh, I, I have friends in Bangalore who, and, uh, and uh, they are, you know, Wildlife comes first for them. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Vishwas, yeah, do you yeah, want you to say anything? Me, uh, if you could send me that final slide that you're just showing, I would appreciate yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> Share it with others. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we have, I think, you have to receive it uh, directly from, uh, uh, from Rotary itself to your mail ID. And also, we are also mailing you oh, uh, yeah. this particular slide. Directly come to you, uh, I think by today or tomorrow morning comes to you directly from there only. I appreciate uh, so, and also we will we'll also send you that. Okay. Yeah. And also, so, uh, you know, there are others who, if they, you need any other, I'm always available and I would love to help uh, people who are really interested in and motivated in, in going further with not only the topics I mentioned, but are the other topics that may be of interest students alive. So just reach sure. out. Okay. okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah, please talking something. Sorry, I no no I just said I wanted to say yeah. again that students, faculty, anyone who needs to um, don't be afraid to reach out. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh do you want to say anything or will uh, let us conclude yeah. the session? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Professor Bajaj. Uh, it was uh, really nice hosting you today, and uh, thanks for your wonderful words. We'll 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 definitely convey this to our student members as well as our professional members who are really interested in this area to carry out research and further activities. And um, I will ask them to uh, get in touch with you, and uh, your advice and uh, your suggestions would be really helpful. Thank you, and uh, have a nice day. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all the participants be a part of today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Professor Bajaj. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.